As noted, I'm going to be talking about female social dominance, which, as many of you know, has been described in lemurs for a very long time. Um, and people tend to study female dominance somewhat in isolation or in conjunction with uh, sexual size monomorphism. And I'm going to argue that these two features should actually be uh, more closely tied to each other, as well as to uh, some observations that predate observations of female social dominance, which is uh, dealing with the unusual genitalia of female um, lemurs. And I'm going to add to this suite of characteristics two more behavior, including that females uh, play, uh, engage in rough and tumble play, and also engage heavily in scent marking. And this is not just a random collection of traits or characteristics. This is precisely the collection of characteristics that are evidenced by the female spotted hyena, which is uh, the most masculinized female uh, animal on the planet. And the reason has to do with the female's exposure to androgens at particular time points in development. And so I'm going to propose that female social dominance in lemurs is actually a trait related to female masculinization. And to put all of this into evolutionary context, I'm taking you to sexual selection uh, theory in traditional species in which we know the mechanisms by Darwin, um, proposed by Darwin, principally that males compete with each other and that females uh, choose between males. And what males are competing with and what females are basing their choice on tends to be the suite of characteristics that you see in males, including dominance or behavioral displays evidenced in this series of photos, uh, the greater size advantage that males have over females, which comes at a cost of de delaying their uh, sexual maturity, um, the showy genitalia, so drawing attention to your reproductive organs, uh, a suite of weapons or ornaments, um, the male's engagement in more complex song, as well as the male's uh, preeminence in olfactory cues. And if you look at this suite of characteristics from a uh, proximate perspective, the mechanism is um, essentially explaining sex differences and the mechanism that explains those sex differences is the male's exposure to androgens, both prenatally during a period of what we call organizational effects, permanent effects, or in adulthood during periods we talk about as activational effects of hormones. So this reflects what happens in traditional species, um, and it is somewhat altered in what I'm calling unusual species where we invoke the other mechanisms proposed by Darwin, namely female-female competition and male choice of females. And what you see here is that there is a somewhat of a sex reversal in these traits, including things like female dominance. And uh, what you see in this uh, suite of um, species are females that might show only one of these characteristics. So something like female dominance in the bonobo or unusual genitalia in the elephant. But a number of these other species show the whole gamut of these characteristics. And those are the species sort of under the spotted hyena. And the question here is whether lemurs, strepsorine primates, are more like bonobos and only show female dominance, or whether they're actually more like hyenas and show this whole suite of characteristics. So uh, many people study female dominance from the perspective of asking why female dominance in strepsorines? Why is this beneficial? And I would argue that that's not really the interesting question, right? Strepsorines are placental mammals, and if you think about it, any placental mammal that invests heavily in their offspring would benefit by being dominant and having better access to resources, right? So the question, I think, is not so much why female dominance, but how female dominance. The reason I say how is because if androgens underlie the acquisition of dominance, the control of dominant behavior, aggressive behavior, then how is it that 
strepsirrhines in particular, have managed to overcome the suite of costs that normally accompany exposure to androgens in females, right? So the reason, in other words, the reason you don't have dominance in females more uh, universally is because exposure to androgens comes at significant costs. And so we're going to look at whether uh, strepsirrhines suffer any of these costs. And here I'm going to be uh, talking about um, costs associated with aggression. Okay. So uh, just to get us started, this is a fairly recent phylogeny by Julie Horvath and colleagues that was based predominantly on material from animals at the lemur center. So it represents a phylogeny of species um, living at the lemur center that were available for study. And I'm going to select a, a subset of the uh, animals that uh, make up this phylogeny. And I will start by focusing on these species to review some patterns of female uh, masculinization of genitalia. And then I'm going to focus on the ring-tailed lemur specifically to tell you about some integrative studies. And then I'll end by focusing on this last clade of uh, strepsirrhines, the ewe lemur, that present a really interesting opportunity for comparative studies to get at the evolution of female dominance. Okay. All right, so all of this research was conducted at the uh, Lemur Center, which many of you know has these large outdoor forested enclosures where animals can uh, roam freely, oftentimes in mixed species groups. They can become habituated to human observers so we can watch their behavior in naturalistic settings. There's also a full veterinary staff at the Lemur Center, so we can take advantage of routine health examinations to collect blood samples, uh, look at these animals up close and personal, take x-rays, and so forth. What's more, these animals can be habituated to uh, being captured and allowing us to sample them on a more routine basis, in this case, sampling uh, scent secretions. And then it also offers the opportunity to do uh, controlled experiments. And what's illustrated here is the experimental uh, behavioral bioassays where we can present odors back to animals and ask them to discriminate um, based on any number of traits. Okay, so starting with this cast of characters, these is, this is representing some of the more nocturnal solitary species. And I know it's a little early in the morning for, for full frontals, but if you bear with me, um, this is showing you female animals uh, with the size, uh, the whole body as size reference. And what we're going to do is zoom in on the genitals. You'll see already from this picture that it's a relatively a prominent structure for these little gals. And up close and personal, what you see is not only that these females have an elongated clitoris, but that this clitoris is fully traversed to the tip by the urethra meaning that these gals are peeing out the tip just like males. I often say these girls could write their name in the snow. And if you don't know this, this is actually an uber masculinized trait. You don't get this normally without exposure to androgens. Moving on to include some of the uh, more diurnal and larger bodied um, species, we see that this uh, characteristic continues. Um, but here what you're, you're seeing first is the genitalia of females outside of the breeding season. And you could say, okay, they're kind of cryptic. In fact, the top three, the females are imperforate, meaning their vagina does not, ex it's, it's fused closed for most of the year outside of the breeding season um, and only opens for short periods of uh, sexual receptivity. And that's even true of the ring-tailed lemur up until puberty. But what you see in the breeding season is that these girls uh, really flaunt their stuff. Um, so the vagina opens and uh, you see a change in color, a change in size. And if you look at the second photo, you could argue that this little gal uh, has uh, genitalia that rival the big butts of baboons, right? So they're actually drawing attention to um, their reproductive organs. All right. So, 
Zooming in on the uh, ring-tailed lemur, for instance, looking at her from the rear end, you can see why some people have thought it challenging to sex animals in the wild. Um, and taking advantage of natural mortality that happens, we were able to do some dissections of the genitalia to show that the uh, unusual characteristics are not um, confined to the outside, but if you actually look at the entire genital tract, what you see is that the female clitoris is actually 70% the length of the male penis, okay? And on x-ray, you can see that the female still retains an os clitoridis at the tip of her uh, glands. So just to quickly uh, oh, move on to uh, other body measures, Many people have recognized that strepsirine primates are size monomorphic, right, so that there's no size advantage per se. And indeed, if you look at body length or shoulder height, you can see that there is no statistical uh, difference between um, males and females. But if you carefully control for the age of animals, you can see that you, there actually is a size a weight advantage to the males. That's their muscles. So it actually makes female dominance all the more interesting in that the males actually have the uh, strength advantage. Uh, some of you might know that there is this phenomenon of the 2D, 4D digit ratio, which in humans is greater in females than in males. So females tend to have uh, fingers, two, second and fourth digit fingers that are of equal length, uh, so their ratio is about one, whereas males is about 0.9. And this is a, a standard thing that you can see altered when animals are exposed to androgens in utero. And what we see in the ring-tailed lemur is that this digit ratio is reversed, okay? So, just to summarize this portion of the, of the presentation, alongside female dominance, you also see these masculinized uh, anatomical traits in the females, including elongated clitoris and uh, that is traversed by the urethra, as well as this uh, blatant reproductive advertisement. You see also sexual size monomorphism as well as this uh, reversed or masculinized appendicular ratio. So now I wanted to move on to the more focused studies on ring-tailed lemurs to ask whether these masculinized traits could be uh, explained by hormonal uh, exposure. And so here we're going to look at the hormone concentrations in males and females, as well as uh, in females that are gestating. And the first thing that you will note if you look at the bar for testosterone is that male, adult male lemurs have more testosterone than do females. And this is not surprising. It's what you see in most other masculinized species. What is a little bit more unusual is that females have close to comparable levels of androstenedione as do males. And androstenedione is a precursor hormone to testosterone. And what's even more unusual is that when females are pregnant, both of these hormones increase significantly, androstenedione increasing to the male range. So the question here now is, could the androgen increases that you're seeing in the females actually be transferred to their developing fetuses? and account for the masculinization of daughters. And to look at this question, we followed a number of uh, females over the course of several years, and we measured uh, their hormone concentrations, and what you're gonna see here is consecutive testosterone concentrations um, during periods when the female is not pregnant, in black, versus periods in which she's carrying a male fetus and periods when she's carrying a female fetus. One of the first things you see is that when she's bearing sons, there is more testosterone. And if you look at the later portions of uh, those bars, that's at a time when the fetal testes are differentiating and contributing additional testosterone, which is what's responsible for masculinizing males. But what you see importantly under the red bars is that there is an early and continued increase in testosterone throughout gestation when females are carrying daughters. And this is happening uh, not because of something in the infants, but these are maternal androgens. 
And so it is possible, there is a source of androgen available to developing females early at the time that their genitalia would differentiate as well as, as late at the time that the brain structure's underlying behavior would differentiate. So now let's try to see whether some of these androgens are actually getting to the animals. And to do that, we're going to look at infant behavior um, through to adulthood. And we're going to look for these organizational effects. Why in play? Because play is something that is established prenatally and explains why males universally play harder than do females, you know, so across all species. And what we found was uh, this pattern for different kinds of play, same sex between sex. And usually researchers are looking for significant effects, but what we're uh, stoked to see here is the lack of significant differences. This is completely unusual for mammals. There is no difference between the rates at which females engage in rough play and the rates at which males do. The only significant pattern was that overall, same-sex play was occurring more frequently early on and was associated with higher levels of glucocorticoids or stress hormones and could be involved in the establishment of intrasexual dominance hierarchies. In any case, these results are consistent with organizational effects of hormones. What happens when these girls grow up? Well, these are uh, adult profiles, and the bottom panel shows you estrogen, and it shows you estrogens increasing during the breeding season, which is not unexpected. It's when females are cycling and they need to have more of their, quote, female hormones. What is surprising is the top panel, in which at the same time you also see increases in androstenedione and testosterone. And lo and behold, this breeding period is associated with significantly increased rates of aggression female-on-female female aggression as well as female-on-male male aggression. So these gals are still, are, they're kicking butt, and the question now, it, and, and the time at which they do so, is correlated with increasing uh, steroid concentrations. The question now that I pose is whether this increase in aggression in females, directed to other females as well as to males, comes at a cost, and I would argue that it does. So this photo is of uh, uh, an infant that suffered an attack not by a male, as many people might have proposed for infanticide occurring as a male uh, reproductive strategy, but by a female, by this infant's aunt more specifically. And I draw your attention to the fact that there is entirely more aggression used here than is necessary to kill an infant. Why? Probably because this aggression wasn't directed specifically at the infant, but the kid got caught in the crosshairs. So using all the data on infanticide since the dawn of time at the Lemur Center, we looked for patterns about the mom, right, who had an infant be a, a victim and tried to see if there was anything that would be revelatory. If it's a reproductive strategy, all females should be victims particularly older females that are of higher quality. And that was not at all the case. We found that mother's age was the only significant predictor of whether or not her kid would suffer um, uh, an infanticidal attack. And in fact, these moms are a good two years younger than are the moms of uh, infants who survive. So the argument here is that these are the young, inexperienced moms trying to climb the social hierarchy, and it comes at a cost to their offspring. So to summarize this portion of the talk, these masculinized traits could be hormonally mediated, which we see through these various uh, points of evidence, including the timing and type of gestational hormones, the pronounced rough play of infants, and adult aggression that correlates with these uh, same steroids. Moreover, we see that uh, female dominance is costly to these uh, females. Moving on now to olfactory studies still in ring-tailed lemurs, what we did was we started looking at uh, genital scent marking, and we collected samples from the genitalia of both males and females, and then we subjected these secretions to gas, chromatograph, gas chromatography mass spectrometry to identify the compounds. Anything early in uh, eluding off the column early would be a light weight compound, anything later heavy. And the first thing you see here is that the genital scent secretions of lemurs are highly complex, but that females produce more compounds than do males. 
Obviously, this is a very complicated uh, set of data, so we have to find statistical ways of reducing that complexity. And if you do that, in this case, simply by counting um, compounds, you see, again, that male, uh, males produce fewer than do the females and show a bizarre reduction during the breeding season, whereas females show a statistically significant increase during the breeding season. This is equivalent to a sex-reversed pattern. This is not what you would see in other mammals. So again, some aspect of masculinized chemical signaling. All right. Likewise, if you now focus in just on the females and you do, you genotype these females and you find out uh, that you do the chemistry for each one, you see representatives here of a chromatogram for a relatively inbred or genetically less diverse female compared to the chromatogram of a genetically outbred um, female. And if you zoom in on this section of the chromatogram, which is the fatty acid esters, these are the compounds that are traditionally involved in reproductive signaling in other species, including anthropoids. And if you look at the uh, complexity of these fatty acid esters and compare it to the gen genotype of the animals, what you see is that there is a relationship, a positive relationship between how uh, chemically complex a female is and how m genetically diverse she is. This is called odor gene covariance and is the basis for honest olfactory, honest ol ornamentation or honest olfactory signaling. The next question is whether other animals can actually detect these differences. And so here we're taking these scent secretions from these genetically different females, presenting it to unknown females, and asking them if they can tell the difference. Show us if you can tell the difference. And the answer is yes. Females spend more time uh, next to the odors of uh, more um, genetically di diverse females, okay? So this could be viewed as a, a mechanism for female-female competition. You're going to scent mark over the scent of a higher quality female. It can also be the basis for males choosing higher quality females. So back to those two Darwinian mechanisms. Okay. So to summarize this portion, these olfactory studies in ring-tailed lemurs show that sexual selection is actually operating in the female. We see sex reversal in chemical complexity and seasonal uh, differences in, the, in those scents. We see honest and detectable odor gene covariance, all of which is consistent with intersexual female competition. All right, so now moving to these comparative studies in U lemur. Um, what we have is a beautiful representation of U. Lemur at the uh, Duke Lemur Center. And what's very interesting about these uh, species is that the top ones shown in red are known to be female dominant, and the ones shown in pink to be more uh, equivalent in rank. And we confirmed this by doing paired studies of mixed sex pairs. And you can see here that the top species, females are beating up more on the males than vice versa, and that's not the case in egalitarian species. So now, if we study these animals and look at their uh, anogenital scent glands, you see another very unusual feature here, which is that the females have much more investment in their anogenital glands than do the males. Again, a very unusual uh, uh, aspect present in all species regardless of their social dominance. So if you rank them by complexity, regardless of the species, females are more complex than the males. Likewise, if you now take these, uh, if you look at scent marking behavior in these species, regardless of the type of pair bonding or promiscuous uh, system, what you see is all species in which the female is dominant is engaging in much higher rates of scent marking than in the last bar of the uh, equidominant species. Again, very unusual. You would not see this in other mammals. To sum that up, um, normally people are constrained to comparing males versus females. And what was interesting here is that we actually had species uh, across the, the clade of U. lemur where we could compare females to females and show that these female dominant females actually have something very unusual about their hormones relative to the equidominant 
So the point here is that these females that evolved more recently have had a relaxation of their female dominance while still maintaining their masculinized um, genitalia and olfactory glands. So these comparative studies reveal that female dominance is actually the ancestral form of strepsirine primates. You see this in the masculinized genitalia and glandular structures across species. You see this in the investment in scent marking. Um, and you see this in the differences that females show in their reproductive hormones. So to summarize, I would argue that female dominance is just but one aspect of a general syndrome of female masculinization in lemurs, um, and that uh, we can learn a lot by these comparative or focused studies on these exceptional species. And with that, I wanted to acknowledge the many people who participated in making this research possible, uh, and to end by saying none of this work could have been done without the Lemur Center. So thank you.